been awesome. It's been so nice going at that slow pace, stopping doing one uh, week on each of those topics. We've been finding it amazing. In fact, this morning, Darcy preached a great message for us in Papakura on do not commit adultery. But the problem was, it was made aware to me that when uploading her notes to the app so people could follow along, it said, you shall commit adultery. Oh. I'm concerned. Very concerning. But it's all right, because this week I've got murder. So we'll see how that one goes. <laughs> may or may not leave the night out of it. No, it's been awesome. Hey, look, without further ado, we're not here to listen to a silly boy tell silly jokes. So um, I would love to invite our panelists up, Pastor Mike and Liz Griffiths, Pastor Steve Green. Why don't you welcome them up? I don't know what's going on here. Now that's a rip off, I get the stool. The team was very good at bringing the furniture out in the dark, to be honest. They look like they've moved furniture in the dark before. Hey, it is so good to see no, we wouldn't prank you like that. Mike might do that, but I would never do that to you, Liz. Hey, it's so good uh, to have these absolute, uh, there's literally a screw falling out. <laughs> Who's responsible for that one? These absolute juggernauts uh, in the faith. These guys are amazing, so easy to talk to, just real relatable people. I'm sure you've been so blessed if you've had a conversation with them and bring so much wisdom. We want to get as much wisdom as we can out of these three regarding all things relationships, dating, um, marriage, a fear proofing your marriage, all that valuable stuff for different people in the room. But let's just kick straight into it. I'd love for each of you to introduce yourself and give us a, like a one minute backstory on the relationship scenarios you've had throughout your life and how you've landed. <laughs> Steve's looking at me like, brother, I need at least 15 minutes. <laughs> but I've heard actually yours is very brief. So yeah, okay, so, well, so you start I'm, us off. So current relationship status, married. Amen. Um, and uh, <laughs> this is our, uh, we'll be, in September we'll be married 17 years. So Be Bex is unfortunately sick today. Yeah. She was good. I wasn't sure if she was sick or just sick of you, but she's not here. <laughs> she's at home. <laughs> bit of both though, bit, bit of, of both. both. Yeah. She's watching online. Uh, but we married 17 years this year. Um, we uh, started dating when she was 16 and I was 17 years old. So we're kind of high school sweethearts. Um, I had very few girlfriends before her. I think I had one proper girlfriend before I um, started dating Bex. She had many boyfriends before me though, so. <laughs> yeah, she's, uh, for those watching online, Bex is now in the chat, um, confirming if that's true or not. I like that you said, I think I had one. You don't usually lose count if it's one. Was it one? One more, one more. One more than me. <laughs> um, I um, met Mike when I was 24. No, I wasn't, was 22, moved to Dunedin. Um, I had never had a boyfriend. So I had done like big friend groups, my friends meant heaps to me, lots of guy friends, lots of girlfriends, like friends, friends. And, uh, and um, yeah, and um, so moved from Christchurch to Neaton and met Mike down there and uh, we were friends for a while and then we started dating and then before we even knew it, we were married and we've been married 27 years. Um, yeah, so there we go. That was awesome. Was that, right? that was awesome. Okay. Yeah, uh, so for me, I, I didn't get saved till I was 22. Had lots of girlfriends along the way. And. Um, How many? Lots. lots. More than two. More than two. <laughs> <laughs> On this panel, that qualifies as lots, yeah. right? Um, and it took me four years uh, as a Christian before I got my you know, the whole conform to the pattern of the world thing until I got that flipped around the right way and then God brought Liz along and, and I'm a very blessed man. Powerful. Now, there's obviously a whole bunch of stuff we could talk to and we, we have limited time. So um, we're gonna start on a few questions and make our way through and sort of just see where God leads us, where we park up, where the wisdom's coming and if it's not, we'll move on. Um, but we've got a few questions here to make our way through. Let's start like right at the beginning um, on dating, right? Because this is such an important part of forming relationships. Now, in our series today, in the morning across all our campuses, we focus on do not commit adultery. Now that specifically focuses on marriage and we'll get to marriage, but it opens up the conversation for everything to do with relationships. How we see the person that we exclusively commit ourselves to um, in a relationship. And so it starts right at the early days with dating. How do we go about this? Because this is one of those areas, especially guys, have no idea what 
to do or how to come about this. How should we approach dating? Liz, do you have any thoughts on a healthy approach to dating, particularly perhaps in the church? What was that particularly? Yeah, I guess, I mean, we're all in church, church right now, yes. so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so look, I, I think that, um, I know that for me, it was really important to me to have a really good friend group that was guys and girls. Um, and that was really important. And, and so I didn't kind of, I, I just, I guess I just felt like I felt quite secure in myself and who I was. It was really important to me to be right with God. Um, my relationship with God was really important to me. I, I kind of had big dreams of what I wanted to do with my life and God and ministry. And, and so it was really important to me that I ended up with somebody that, that was going to be, you know, do that journey with me. Um, and so, and so for me, the, the, that was really important. And so I sort of didn't go looking for it. Um, and I really just did trust God that he would bring around the, the, the right person at the right time. Um, and I tell you what, there was lots of possibilities along the way, but I just, but possibilities weren't good enough for me because I kind of felt like I get one shot at this. Um, and, I, and I really did have a, have a heart to want to serve God. So I just kind of felt like, you know, no settling for second best. I just needed to wait which I did. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> wow. This is doing so much good for my self-esteem. Just saying, <laughs> just saying putting it out there. Um, for me, coming into dating, I dated as a non-Christian, and what that essentially meant was dating was just finding someone that we could kind of do some physical stuff and have some fun along that line. That was essentially the summation of the dating philosophy, certainly of me and my mates. Then I became a Christian, and then it was like, okay, now we're doing, it, we're doing it God's way. This really is about that, you know? And the whole thing of, of this is about surrender, right? It's about saying, okay, I'm gonna follow Jesus, it's yours. I don't have any rights anymore. I'm, I'm gonna do it your way. And it took, me, it took me a while to work out what that was like. And I remember when Liz and I are kind of like, maybe there's something here. We had to actually have a conversation and define, well, what does dating mean for us? And it meant two things. It meant, firstly, that we were gonna explore the possibility that maybe we were the one for each other for the rest of our lives, and so we were gonna do some fun stuff and do some social stuff, and we were gonna kinda work that out and see if that's what this was. But the second thing was that this wasn't just gonna be an excuse to get physical. Th that was pointless. Uh, and so for us, it was about we were gonna have heaps of fun, and we were not gonna use this as an excuse to get physical. And of course, the reality is, is that I really wanted to get physical, right? Like, up in every 20-year-old I mean, male, like, so, so it wasn't that I was suddenly holy and didn't want that, but it was just, I couldn't muck around with this anymore. I tried my way for so many years, and I just came to the point of going, I suck at this, I'm seeing this wrong, so if we're gonna do this, let's have some, I mean, my very first date with Liz, <laughs> I took her down to the poor charmer's wood chip pile and we just ran up and down the wood chip pile and jumped off and did flips and did kind of, like this wasn't roses and candlelight. This was, let's go and do something mildly illegal and have a whole lot of fun. So they, they didn't really put the signs up saying you weren't allowed to do that till later, so. It worked, you're married. Tell you what, dating advice, the first date I ever took Bex on, we went to KFC. And got, and got popcorn chicken. I know. It was, uh, it was, popcorn chicken had just come out, and I was like, I really want to try that. So I was like, hey, we're going to go on a date. We're going to go get KFC. It was amazing. It all worked out stupendously. I think, um, I think when it comes to dating, there is a really weird stigma about it in the church. And I think that's one thing we have to address straight up. And, and talk about is that for young people dating in the church, it's like there is a microscope on you and there is everyone watching and there's this pressure to get it right and there's this pressure to not get it wrong and there's this pressure to find the one and if they're not the one, what does that mean? And if I do date this person, does that mean they're the one and all this kind of stuff? So he here's some simple advice on how to approach dating. Chill out, relax. You're just getting to know each other. That's okay. It's okay to get to know somebody. Having coffee doesn't mean walking down the aisle. Friends of people who may be looking to start dating, chill out, leave them alone. Get out of their business. 
Like, let them go have coffee and get to know each other without you talking about it and being weird about it and then putting pressure on them and everyone weirdly in your friend group going, oh, did you hear about something? Shut up. <laughs> You're not helping the situation. They already feel the pressure of not messing this up because they're friends and they're getting to know each other. They don't wanna mess up the friend group. And what does this mean? Just take the pressure off and let's be okay with going out and having coffee with somebody. Let's be okay with going for a walk with somebody and actually getting to know them because that's what dating essentially is. Dating isn't a covenant commitment. You do that when you say, I do, before the Lord and before this company of people. That's, let's keep dating to what it really is. It's getting to know somebody on a, on a level that is maybe more than just hanging out as a friend group and actually just getting to know them. Who, who are you? Do I like this person? Are they nice? Do they treat people well? Do they have the same kind of morals and do they have the same values that I hold? Do they see themselves going the same places that I would see myself going? Do we align? Is there something going on here? If there's not, fine. It's all good. Date somebody else. It doesn't make you a bad person because you're getting to know somebody. Like let's, let's take all the weirdness off it and let's take the weirdness off ourselves and let's take the pressure off it all and let's not put a whole lot of weirdness around our friend groups when people do start dating and all that kind of stuff. Because I think that's what makes it really hard. And I think if you're ever gonna find the one you wanna marry, you have to talk to someone. <laughs> and what I see right now is a bunch of dudes who are clueless. <laughs> they don't talk to nobody because they're scared of getting it wrong. And they're scared of messing it up. And they're scared of what other people are gonna say and what other people are gonna think. So can we make a promise to each other that we're not gonna be those people and we're just gonna let people get to know each other in a very authentic and normal way and if it doesn't work out, that's fine. It doesn't mean anything. It just means they weren't really that compatible for you right now and then you can go and talk to somebody else. It's all good. That's what I think. Can we thank Steve? That's brilliant. That is actually, if we left today single people with that, that Thank you for saying that, that's great. I totally agree, and, and I think you know, at the heart of this, it's this thing that Jesus said, right? Do unto other people what you want them to do unto you. If you want everyone else to be super freaking weird when you're going having a coffee with someone, then go and be super weird with them. But you don't, right? When, when you're having a coffee with someone, you just want people to walk on by and let it be, just what Steve's saying. So start treating people through that lens. Ask the question, man, if I'm having a coffee with someone, how do I want people to treat me and start doing that for each other? Yeah. It's just so good to give it room to breathe. Look, as, as a person in the church, look, I know there's many people here that are just like me. You love to have a, a banter, like a little joke, you know, like elbow, like pointing at someone. The moment I discover that there may actually be interest, I back right off. The last thing I wanna do is be responsible for making that person feel like every eye is on them, there's pressure to make it happen, and then it doesn't happen. That could have been beautiful. That could have been God-ordained, and I got in the way. So I just love that challenge that we would commit ourselves as a people just to give people breathing space and get out of it and mind your own business. Good story. We actually had exactly that happen, didn't we? We started hanging out, and we were in a friend group, and then we started spending time by ourselves, and then so people started talking, and it got really uncomfortable, and Mike freaked out, and so, <laughs> and so he backed right away, right? Remember? And do you remember? Do you remember this? <laughs> so he backed right away. And I got really annoyed, because I actually, he was a really great friend. He was one of my best friends. I just moved to the city, and I really valued his friendship. So I was gutted because it was like I'm losing, not only like potentially is he like a bit of a right, but actually I'm losing a really good friend here and I was actually really annoyed. So I told you so, hey, we had to have a little sit down. So we had a little sit down conversation about it, at which point he realized that maybe we should be having conversation about other stuff, like maybe it is a little bit more. Would that be a fair summation? So I think if you've had that happen with somebody and so you've backed right away, I want to encourage you to go round two and organize that coffee and give it another go. I have to say I'm, I'm eternally grateful that Liz had the courage to walk through the weirdness and go, Jeepers, what are we doing? Like, what's going on here? Why, why are you backing away? And, and because she kind of already knew that I was really into her, but it was just strange weirdness going on with other friends and the whole thing. And it was just easier for me to back away. And maybe I was afraid but I'm eternally grateful that she made the gutsy call and had the gutsy conversation, which could have gone bad. Could have gone bad, but she had it anyway and she wasn't weird about it. And thanks, babe. So good. No problem.
Hey, now it's been a few years since any of you have asked someone out on a date, but what, what are some thoughts and guidelines like, okay, you're interested, you've had a few conversations, there's, I swear there's a twinkle in their eye. How do you go about actually asking them out on a date? Like what's appropriate? How do you position yourself around them in not a weird way? How do you go from I'm interested, I think there might be something, to actually getting yourself in a cafe with a cup of coffee? Okay. Um, <laughs> there's, there's a, have you guys seen We Bought a Zoo? This, is that what it's called? We bought a zoo? And there's that cool bit where he's like, you just need 15 seconds of insane courage. And, and I think like sometimes that's so true, right? It's just, hey, I'm interested in this person. I, you, you're never going to know unless you put yourself out there. And putting yourself out there does, does make room for you to get hurt. And that's okay. And because you grow and you learn and you get resilient and that's all right. So there is that point where you just have to say, I think this person's all right, I like them, and, and I don't know, we seem to be connecting a little bit. Um, or you can just go in like completely blind. You'd be like, I like it, so I'm just gonna make the big, bold approach and then catch them off guard and then see how that goes for you, fella. But like maybe, this, it's a different generation to when we were dating and stuff. You know, we used to pass notes to friends and they go, can you just pass it to her? Because tick box, yes, no. Just, yeah, tick box, yes, no. Um, I don't need a maybe in my life, I need a yes or a no, I'm black or white. Um, but maybe, I don't know, um, just message them or something and just, uh, just put, you have to put yourself out there. I'm getting the don't message me, okay? <laughs> don't message. Go and have a conversation uh, like a big person. But I think you've got to be willing to actually put yourself out there and, and say, hey, look, do you want to, um, do you want to, do you want to grab a coffee? You don't have to put everything on the table the first day, but just say, do you want to grab a coffee? Do you want to catch a movie? Do you want to do something? Um, I think that would, that's really at the end of the day, 15 seconds of courage. And I think if we take your first challenge, which is just chill out, it doesn't have to be so daunting. And if you're on the receiving end of an ask, um, acknowledge and honor the bravery it took to ask and to be gracious in your response. If it's no, you should say no. Don't, don't lead them on, don't lie about that. Don't go, I'll just go on one then um, and lead them astray. But you can be no, but you can be gracious in that as well. Frosty, what's your experience? I like. Oh, we're really running out of time. We're gonna have, we're gonna have to move. Uh, my, um, uh, Darcy is my second girlfriend. My first girlfriend was, like, it was serious, but it was just out of high school. Um, that ended on good terms, so no, no hard feelings there. I met Darcy. Uh, she claims to this day she asked us out on our first date, but, but um, no, she didn't. She, she said to me, oh, Frosty, I know you love tea and I got given this free voucher to a high tea and because I know you love tea, do you wanna go on this high tea with me? I thought, okay, she's gotta use the voucher. She knows I like tea, makes sense. <laughs> she, tr she played it down as hard as she could and I was like, but at this point, to be honest, I was like, I've, I've had my eye on, on Darcy, so look, I'll, I'll go along and just see. Like, I don't know if I like her. I'll just go and see if I like her. And, I, and there was that pressure because I was like on staff at the church and the whole thing. I'm like, oh my gosh, everyone's going to see. But I decided, stuff them, honestly. I was like, I'm just, I'll be single forever unless I get amongst it. So I got amongst it. And I was like, I don't even know if I would say I like this girl, but I think I might. I think I could. I think there's an option here. So I'm just going to go on the high tea. And worst case scenario, I had some mean tea um, and some nice little nibbles. And so went on the high tea and it went really well. And uh, we just kept hanging out. I don't know how it became more official, but yeah, it just started that way. So pretty low key, but she, that wasn't our first date. Okay, final part before we move on to something a little bit different is um, just, just some advice for, for single guys and single girls. I mean, obviously we, we often hear the thing like, don't focus on the, you know, the one who is the one, focus on becoming the one that the people you're looking for are looking for. Um, outside of that, what, what are some advice? Maybe we'll, we'll start, Liz, some advice for the single ladies, and then um, we'll try the guys, but we'll probably put, have to come back to you for advice for the single guys as well. <laughs> All the single. So single ladies out there, they're at their age, they're like, yeah, I wanna sort of find someone. Yeah, what's some advice? Look, I, I just think you just gotta, you just gotta be that person. I, I know it's, you know, you said that's what we say, eh? But um, I just think be, be faithful, be faithful to your relationship with God, uh, just be a great friend to people. Um, if, you, um, if you are having a bit of a look around, have a look at how guys are treating everybody else. 
So I think as a single girl, to look and go, how are they treating their mates? How are they treating the other girls that are friends? What are they like with their sister? Like, actually have a look. You'll learn a lot about a person, their character, what they value, what's important to them. Um, and, you know, what for me, which was the real clincher when I um, fell for Mike, was his relationship with God. It wasn't initially a physical thing, was it? It was actually we both fell for the value and the... And so we, and we could probably say this about each other, but I would watch Mike in, in the kind of like friend circles and how he treated other girls and how he was in his relationship with God. I was observing and, and, um, and how he was with other guys. And, and so, those, so looking for those values. So I think that's what I would say is be, be the sort of person. And because what, you know, what's, what do we say? Like a prince is looking for a princess. He's not looking for anything else. So, so actually be the sort of person, think about um, the sort of person you want and think about what he might be looking for and then be that. Awesome. And just, and get a bit confident. Yep. And, you know, make a bit of an effort. <laughs> you know, like... Eh? It's like, yeah, it's like first impressions, like, oh, we shouldn't worry about first impressions. Well, first impressions do count. They do. They. So, uh, you know, yeah, there we go. Nice. And, and ladies, it's, it's okay for you to ask, because guys are often scared and terrified. I think the guy should man up, get it done, ask, ask them out on a date. But it's, it's not off the cards. Like, if you're interested, and just ask them on a date. Like, it's okay. You can do that. 2022. The one thing I'll just quickly add to that that I think Darcy has explained brilliantly when she's often spoken about relationships is she said like, the best way to do it is just run your race for Jesus. You see someone you're interested, just keep running your race for God. Look beside you, oh, they're still there. That's awesome. Not nice to see you. I'm gonna keep running my race for God. And when you feel like you're ready, you're matured enough, the season is right. If you look beside you and they're still running their race for God, then they might be compatible. If you're trying to drag them into church, drag them along, trying to convince them to be Christians, to love God, that's a really hard road and you might need to continue doing that. So just first and foremost, go after God and see who's running that, that race alongside that you. That is such a great point because the thing that first caught my eye with Liz was that she wasn't trying to impress me. She wasn't flirting. She wasn't doing those things. She was passionate about missions. She was passionate about God. She, was, she had opened a travel agency. She was doing a bunch of stuff and she was not all that interested in impressing me. And I'd never really struck that before. And what it led me to, it led me to realize that actually this girl had a whole worldview and a whole substance about her that just totally impressed the socks off me. And I think that we've got to realize that the pattern of the world is physical attraction. That's, that's the key thing. And then like if you kind of get on, well, that's a win. And then, you know, and then spiritual worldview, are we going the same direction in life? Really doesn't matter a whole lot because, you know, we can do our own thing. I tell you, the reality of any relationship, any relationship, is that the spiritual always sits at the bottom. It just always does. And that was what the great thing about us was we recognized that actually we wanted the same things out of life. We wanted the same things out of God. And we were doing just what you said, Frosty. Run along, doing our thing, and we both kind of were there. And, and if I needed someone to, to talk to someone at church who was having a bad day, who was a female, I, I could always count on Liz to be that person when I knew that I wasn't the right person and vice versa. And that was so important. I've seen people who build relationship on the physical first, physical attraction, the spark, the fire, the whole thing. It's like building a top story on stilts. Yeah. It just is. And like the first storm that comes along, the first little earthquake that comes along and she is all coming down. Yeah. But if you guys look at the world the same way, that's, yeah. that's a foundation. That's where you got something. Yeah, I think I think for guys like advice um, for you it would be you know you've got to you've got to get yourself right like you want to be going into a relationship with as little baggage as possible, um, but keeping in mind that you're always a work in progress. So don't don't be like I, when I'm I'm going to work on me and then when I'm good then I'm you're never going to be that good. Like you're you're always going to be a bit mo messed up and broken. That's the journey of the human existence is and and that journey with Jesus is that constant you're you're working out your salvation daily. You're getting more close to God. You're dealing with your stuff daily. You're on that journey. And so be okay to still be on the journey and maybe journey with somebody and, and, and walk that out with them. I think you wanna be um, the kind, again, it's that whole thing, like I'm not, 
often we look at, this is what I want in a partner, and I want this, and I want that, and here's my list of things that I want, because yes, queen, I'm a, I'm a queen, I need this, and I deserve this, and I'm worth this, and all this kind of stuff. One of the things I hate to hear is, I'm worth this, I deserve this. Like, I just think that's all rubbish. I think, like, you need to be the best version of you for somebody else. And not have this stand like, I need this, and I need that, and I need this, and I need that, because I'm high maintenance. I just, no, 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 no. Like, you die to you and give your life in service for somebody else. And you bring out the best in that person, and they do that in the same way for you, and then you both flourish. And so we've got to change the way we look at it. So work on you, deal with your stuff, be a, 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 a devoted, dedicated follower of Jesus, allow him to do his transformative work in you, and then be a blessing to somebody, and you'll find someone real good, I'm telling you. Awesome. Hey, one of the questions that came through Instagram, um, which I think is important for us just to touch base on, is, is it okay to be friends or best friends with our ex? So we've managed to maturely work through the breakup, but we're not together anymore. Can you keep being mates with them? Yeah, I think that what you've got to realize in a friend group is if you've tried something that hasn't worked out and, there's an, and you're an ex, you've just got to realize that um, you've still got to be kind, you've still got to be courteous, but you've also got to realize that you're not going to help that person yeah. by trying to be their rescuer. You know what I'm saying? Like, like there needs to be a season of just a little bit of distance so you can both heal. So you see each other, it's like, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. But you're not gonna have deep meaningfuls with them. If they wanna have deep meaningfuls with you, that's not gonna work. You need to allow distance for both of you to heal. That's, that's the reality on those things. But you can, totally, you can totally be friends again with your ex, but you've just gotta realize it's gonna take a little bit of time. There's gonna be a few months of awkward, and that's okay. Like, welcome to real life. Life is awkward, it just is. Uh, and, and that's okay. So I think the key thing is stay courteous though. Don't blow people off. Don't badmouth people behind their back. Don't go doing that. This is someone else's husband or someone else's wife you're talking about. Have some respect. Be kind, but also realize that in this season, you're not gonna be the person to help them through what they're going through. So connect them with someone else. Be a, be a fan, give them some room, and it all comes right in time. Right. Awesome. Hey, hands up in this room if you're married. Awesome. Bunch of people. Now, I think it's fair to say, I mean, I remember standing at, at this altar. Who, who else has been married at this altar? <laughs> yep, a few people. I remember standing here in front of Darcy um, and making that absolute undeniable commitment that I would be faithful to her for the rest of my life, uh, have been every intention that I will be. I think that's everyone's scenario. I think everyone that stands at that altar commits themselves to being absolutely faithful. And yet in New Zealand, 42% of marriages end in divorce. So something's not going right. I wonder if we could just engage in this a little bit and just chat a bit about how as a married couple, we can ensure we stay far away from that fire so that we don't get burned. What are some practical things we can put in place to make sure we actually honor that commitment we made on our wedding day? Uh, yeah, one of the things for us is we, we talk about having um, total transparency. So um, I was telling a story this morning um, about many years ago, I was on a trip to um, California for my job and I was on the flight and I'm a bit extroverted so I just talk to everybody that will listen to me and chatting away and super kind of, you know, excited about life. And so as I was sort of, the plane was coming into land, I didn't realise but the, the air steward was kind of hitting on me a bit and suggesting that we could go and get a drink and, and catch up later on, which I was totally shocked about and embarrassed and hadn't sort of seen that coming. Um, we were in a, I think we'd only been married like six months or something. I was like, Whoa! I didn't know quite what to do, good little Christian girl that I was, but I, that was the situation. And so what I did as soon as um, I said, obviously said no, um, <laughs> and then got to the hotel that I was staying at, and first thing I did was I rang Mike, and we talked about it, and we had a laugh about it, and, um, and we were able to do that because we were faithful to one another and we've made this commitment to have total transparency. So when those odd, weird, funny, sometimes awkward things happen, um, you just talk about them with your spouse because otherwise you feel guilty and you feel like you've done something wrong, but often you've done nothing wrong. It was just this bizarre situation. So, so we, we did that and we were able to have a laugh about it. So I think just having that transparency, keeping everything in the light and not having anything in the dark, not having secrets, that they just don't work. They get power and we know that the enemy will use that. Um, so... I think the other thing too is, um, you know, the Bible talks about sowing and reaping and how we reap what we sow. That's, that's a principle, right? 
And I, when you think about it, why is, why is your courtship so good? Because you're just sowing into each other all the time. It's just, man, I'm just loving on you and just want to be with you and telling you how beautiful you are and flowers and all that kind of stuff. Like that's all sowing, right? And so there's a reaping, there's a response to that, which is awesome. But so often you get into marriage and then you're, you know, you're really driving at your career and maybe you're having babies and now you, there's no sleep. And it's very easy to slide into a situation where really you're actually not sowing anymore. You're not putting anything in. And the problem is, in my opinion, is that many couples get four, five, six, seven years down track and they had a funk and what's going on? They're just reaping what they've sown. Yeah, the problem right. is they've just sown nothing. Yeah. They've yeah. just sown nothing. Now it feels empty. Now we don't feel like we're in love anymore, all that kind of thing. We were so blessed when we had our pre-marriage counseling, a really conservative Christian couple pastors in our church uh, in Dunedin gave us great counsel and uh, they absolutely adored each other. I mean, it was almost embarrassing. Like it was just glorious. And... Um, but they said to us in our pre-marriage counseling, they said, when you guys get to the time in your marriage when you're looking across the room at each other and you're going, and you're thinking to yourself, I hate this person. And we're like, oh, wow, we thought they had a good marriage, but this is like tragic. But they're like, no, 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 you've got to realize there's a reality there. It doesn't mean you don't love each other, but right now I really do not like you. And they said, when you get to that point, just realize it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean it's over. It doesn't mean you've fallen out of love. It just means that you're reaping what you've sown and, you, and you've sown nothing. So now is the time to dig deep and start pouring it back in again. And if you do, you reap what you sow. Right. It all comes back. You, you can have those feelings for your whole life, I believe, in, and that's what we're practicing. And that's what we're finding. So those principles are actually really important. Yeah. How's the sowing going, married couples? What are you actually investing into each other? You know, it's really interesting. Um, Jesus was asked to weigh in on a debate on marriage. And actually not about marriage, it was about divorce. Um, and it's one of the only times we see Jesus really engage in this whole area. And he's being quizzed by the Pharisees. And there's two different groups of them. They had two different schools of thought. And uh, it was all around divorce. So one, one school of thought was that you could divorce your wife for any reason. So for anything that displeases you, you could write a letter of divorce and just divorce them. So she burnt the toast, divorced. You know, you could do whatever you want. And then there was another school of thought that was um, you could only divorce because of adultery. And so there's a debate going on. And Jesus is asked to weigh in right in the middle of that. And they say, what, you know, what do you, what do you say? Like, what, what do you say about this? And he says, uh, in the beginning, it's almost like you've got it all wrong. He said, like, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife. He goes right back to the original design of marriage. He goes right back to Genesis. And he says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and the two shall become one. And so really what he's saying to them is this. You think marriage is about two individuals fighting for what they want, trying to make a compromise and I'm not getting what I want, so I'm out. He said, you've got it all wrong. It's not two individuals, it's two becoming one. It's two individuals dying to themselves and giving their lives in service for the other person. And I'm gonna give my life. So you get, you, a marriage is, a, a wedding is on one day and a marriage starts the very next day. So you put thousands of dollars and hours into preparing a wedding and then you gotta start a marriage. And that's the rubber hitting the road. And so you have to make a decision to make that person the one every single day. You have to choose to love, choose to give, choose to serve. So. Marriage then becomes this whole, this, this, uh, the intention of it is not what do I get out of this marriage and my needs aren't being met and this is what I want out of marriage. It's what do they need from me to, be, to flourish, to have the best marriage. And if I'm giving my life like that and they're doing the same, we're both gonna be richly satisfied. We're both gonna flourish. We're both gonna find this thing amazing because we're both giving our lives to meet each other the best that we possibly can. And so what that means is a lot of conversations. So if, you, if, you're, if you're thinking, oh man, I can't wait to get married, it's gonna be absolutely amazing. Get ready for long, late night, awkward conversations. That's what I wanna say. They don't tell you this in pre-marriage stuff, but you're gonna be up till 4 a.m. many, many times talking about little niggly issues that are ridiculous, but you just gotta keep on talking about them. The, the key to a healthy relationship and marriage is, is, is open communication. You've got to talk. You've got to bring anything and everything to the table and you've got to have safe communication where you can actually nut through the issues and f figure them out and get to a resolution and get to a place of understanding. That if you are going into arguments as a married couple thinking that, like you won, if there's a winner and a loser, let me tell you, there's two losers. 
If, you, if you're coming into a marriage argument and there's a winner and a loser, you're no, no longer two becoming one, you're now two. Because two becoming one is where there's, we come out of this thing good together, not, not, not a winner and a loser. And so when you come through these conversations, so much of marriage is the collision of two different worlds, two families, two people, two personalities, and you've got to try and make sense of that, and you're not always going to see eye to eye, and it's not always going to make sense, it's not always going to be easy, and you're going to be like, you think like that? What? You're weird. And they're like, you don't think like that? You're weird. And then you've got to try and make sense of that on pretty much every single issue of life, and to do that takes talking. And the reason so many marriages fall apart is because we stop talking, we stop being honest, and we just, oh, I'm grumpy, but I'm just gonna bottle that up inside. You know where that goes? Nowhere. It bottles up and bottles up, and then it just becomes incredibly septic in your relationship. So you know how you started dating? Keep dating. Keep dating in your marriage. Keep doing things that you enjoy. Keep prioritizing time. All those little things. And again, these are things like we go through in our relationship seasons where we're like, we're gonna have date nights all the time, and we go really good for like a month. And then it's like six months later, we're like, we should probably have a date. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, like, we need to date now. Like it's, you just kind of get to the point where you just, you kind of forget about it. Like, okay, let's have a conversation. I'm feeling really distant right now. I'm like, this is, we're not really connecting. Uh, what's going on? I know we've been really busy and we've got kids and we know I've got work and we've got everything that's going on, but I'm really struggling and I, I'm not getting this from you. And, and then they're like, well, I'm not getting this from you. Like, well, we're both missing the mark. So let's work better and let's schedule next week. We're gonna have a date night. We're gonna do something fun. and, and then you bring that intentionality back, but that only happens through conversation. Most like issues are because we don't talk and we expect them to read our mind. They should be doing this for me. They don't know. They're not mind readers. They're not telepathic. Like we're idiots, us men. We really are. We don't have a clue. Tell us what you need. Tell us what's going on and then we can do the things we need to do. Does that make sense? That's so good. <laughs> that is so good. That's awesome. So a really practical thing you can do if you're a married couple is you can sit down tonight when you get home from church with a hot Milo and you can say to the other person, what's the 1%, what's the one thing that if I did it, it would make a real difference for you? And so then they will say, I really want you to pick up your clothes off the bedroom floor or, or I really want you to make me a coffee in the morning or I really want you to share your day with me, whatever they're gonna say. And so then the other person, what's the one thing that's gonna make the 1% difference? Because we can't change everything yeah. all at once, right? Um, and so what's the one thing that you, you can do for me? And then make a concerted effort. Get it in your phone, get it on the wall, get it on your fridge, get it on your screensaver. Every day, you gotta do that thing. And you'll notice that 1% increase will be significant because the other person will feel really cared for. That's so good. And I, lo I love what you're identifying here, Steve, that it's so important we approach it, that the problem is the problem. I'm not the problem. My spouse is not the problem. The problem is the problem. Let's put it on the table. Let's look at it and let's tackle it together. As long as one of us is the problem, it's always gonna be an us, a them, a winner, a loser. Yeah, which, which and really I think the on. danger is we, um, we, we don't make the effort to understand. And instead we go, oh, you're just being stupid and sensitive and that's not an issue, you need to get over it. Well, that didn't help anybody. And that just put a whole lot more baggage in the mix. And that also put a big divide now between you two. You have to be able to talk in a safe way. And that means that if, if and now normally it's me coming to Bex because I'm a lot more sensitive. So I'm like, when you said that, I was really hurt by that. It's just like, I said what? No recollection of it whatsoever. Like that, what, like I said that, like wasn't what you said, it was how you said it. And then it's like, and, and so like in so many relationships, like, well, you're just being stupid and sensitive, get over it. It's not a big deal. Well, it's not a big deal to you, but it's a big deal to me. And so we have to respect each other that sometimes things that we don't notice are big deals or something that doesn't affect me actually does affect you. And so again, I die to me. I'm not an individual, I'm two becoming one. So I die to me and I go, okay, let me understand. And although I even I don't, I'm, and at the end of it, I may not even agree. I may not even think that it's right or I may think you're still being sensitive and stupid. But at, what I do is I die to that and I go, you know what? I'm gonna try really hard in the future not to do that. And the fact that it did hurt you is not my intention. I'm really sorry about that. And, and I'm gonna do better. And by the end of it, normally I'm going, I know I'm just being too sensitive and I need to work on that. I need to stop being so emotional. I'm really sorry. And then we hug and then we're closer. We're not further apart. 
it's really powerful. Amazing. Hey, look, we're, we're pretty much out of time, but what I want to do just in our last moments is just because we, we have this morning in our campus has been talking about not committing adultery and, and the importance of being faithful to our spouse that we've committed to. Have either of you had conversations, obviously you two and you and Bex had conversations with some really practical things that you have in place, some boundaries that you live by that are just small practical things you do to help you stay away from the fire. An obvious one, you know, is things like not traveling in a car alone with someone of the opposite sex of a, of a relatively similar age. You're just asking for trouble there and things like that. Are there any things that you guys have in place? Yeah, yeah. Uh, quite a few things. Um, and because, because I'm the man in the relationship, I'm much more visually assimilated than, than Liz is because she's a female, obviously. Um, so for me, I didn't have to say obviously, did I? Um, <laughs> So for me, it's things like understanding, you know what Jesus said about, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I say uh, to you that if you think about someone else lustfully, you've already committed adultery in your heart. This is the issue with pornography, right? Is that, is, because what Jesus is saying, firstly, is that actually it's, it's adultery straight off the bat, but secondly, he's giving us the process. It's a, it's, it's a look, if you look at a person lustfully, and then it's the thought lustfully, and then it's the action. That's really helpful. It's, it's, it's a look, it's a thought, and then it's action. And it's really important because if we're gonna deal with the threat of adultery in our lives and unfaithfulness, you gotta kill it at the look. Right? right. So, but, but see, James 1 is also really helpful because he says that you know, temptation happens to all of us. In fact, Hebrews says that, that Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, yet he was without sin. That's important because it tells us temptation is not sin. See, the look is not sin. You, you, there's just people walking around all the time. You, you, you can't not notice people, but it's what happens between the look and the thought. And if that, if that, if, if that thought goes somewhere, you've got like about a second. To deal with that, move your focus, move your eyes, move on, and there's no, fa- no harm, no foul. There's nothing that happens. But if you allow that thought to take root, and James really unpacks this, that's where sin happens, and that's the problem with adultery. Because, uh, sorry, with porn, because porn teaches you the habit of going straight from the look to adultery like that. Just bam. It's just the look and then the thought, because it's the lustful thing. That's why you've got to eradicate it, um, porn. If you've got porn in your life, you've got, you got to find the answers. You've got to get with someone. You've got to get the help. Because it is, it's just always destructive. But to get back to the primary question, boundaries. Yeah, I have a whole bunch of boundaries. I never share any current issues with any female. And if I want to, well, that's on me because God gave me a female to share that with. And if there's something wrong with us, usually because of me, uh, that means that I don't feel I can share that with her. Well, then that's, I got to sort that out until I can share that with her. So I, I never share that. In fact, we had once had a mate come to me and he's like, bro, I just need to talk to you because, you know, our, my wife thinks that you don't like her. And I'm like, oh, wow, no, I really like her. Why, why is that? He says, well, you never share anything with her. I said, and it's like, oh, yeah, I, I'm not going to change that. Sorry. I, I've, got, I've, got a, I've got a girl that I share my heart with, and I'm not going to share my heart with your wife. So uh, I really like her, but that's not going to change. So, um, you know, you've got to have some boundaries. And just what Frosty said, I, I, as often as I, you know, as, as much as I can, I don't go somewhere with a, a, another female that's not Liz. Um, I, I don't try and be in another vehicle or anything else with anyone. I have a little habit if I'm ever on a plane or a bus with someone and I end up sitting next to a woman, the first thing I do is I pull out my phone and start flicking through photographs of my wife and family. Two reasons. One is, because it reminds me where my loyalty is and where my faithfulness is. Second reason is, it is just showing anyone who cares to look over my shoulder that I'm a very happily married man with a trophy wife and fabulous kids. That's it. Could I just add to that? Amazing, wear your wedding ring. I know that sounds trivial and ridiculous, but wear your wedding ring. Sometimes people decide I'm not going to wear it because, you know, it's inconvenient or whatever. I can't be bothered. But Darcy and I were just chatting in the car on the way here. It's like, man, I wear this wedding ring. Firstly, it reminds me in the same way that the photos remind you. And it may be a deterrent to someone. Someone who happens to be interested sees this wedding ring and they think, I'm not going to go there. Who knows, you know, what that might have achieved for me there. So, look, it's not a strict thing, but just a thing. Um, okay, awesome. Mike, you've covered that. I wonder, Steve, if we had just finished with you, final statements. I, I wondered if you could just speak to um, God's response and, and God's grace to those that have crossed this line. That's great, Frosty. That's amazing. Um, so the, the amazing thing about God's grace is it's incredibly far-reaching. Um, in fact, it's so far-reaching, it's got no end or limit to it. So... Here's the truth, friends. 
the Bible says that all have fallen short of the glory of God. There's a standard that God sets for us, and we've all fallen short of it. There is, um, you know, there's the realm of adultery, and um, that is, you know, primarily for a married couple, someone who sleeps with someone who's not their spouse. Um, but there's a whole another layer to that of sexual purity. You know, God's standard for us is not to be sexually intimate with somebody if we're not married to them. That's God's standard. And we didn't quite hit that today, but I want to hit that. I want, I want us to know that that's God's standard for us. Young people, don't conform to the patterns of this world, but let God transform you by changing the way you think. And the thought process we have is the Word of God. And the Word of God teaches us that sexual relationships outside of marriage is wrong. It's sin. It's not right. So if you're in it, get out of it. There's ways you can. Um, but the grace of God is so amazing that when we stumble, and I've stumbled a million times, and I'll probably stumble a whole bunch more, but the grace of God gives us that ability to get up again and start afresh. It's not a license to sin, but the grace of God leads us towards repentance. It leads us towards loving God. It leads us to want to live a life of purity. When you receive the amazing grace of God and He redeems you from your yesterday, you no longer want to live in yesterday. You want to live in a brighter and better tomorrow. So if, if you've messed up in this area, and listen, it would be a very, very safe bet to say that 99.9% .9 of people in this room have maybe made a mistake somewhere in this area along the way, then all we need to do is repent of our sin, turn from it, turn to God, ask Him to forgive us of our sin. The Bible says in um, uh, 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins to Him, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So whatever unrighteousness is there, there is forgiveness and cleansing for that. And then the book of James tells us that if we confess our sins one to another, that, God, that we will receive healing in that process. So potentially, that there is a, there's an opportunity for you tonight to not just have forgiveness, but also healing from the stuff in your life. That God will forgive you of all of your wrongs, but you can also find a journey with somebody just to say, you know what, I need to tell you, I need to tell you. And, and bringing what is in the dark into the light is a very powerful and very spiritual process. Um, it is a tradition we've had for thousands of years as Christians where we confess one to another and we can get free from a whole bunch of stuff. So the grace of God is there for you. Friend. It's a free gift for you. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to deserve it. You don't have to work your way back to it. You don't have to be like, okay, I messed up, so I'm gonna be pure for another three weeks and then I'm gonna come to God. It's not how it works. You're, you're, you're never, it's not about your goodness or your ability. It's all about what Jesus did for you and I on the cross and his goodness and his ability and his finished work. So receive that free gift of grace, start again. And then like Jesus said to the woman that he caught in adultery, go now and sin no more. Go now and sin no more. From this day forward, go now and sin no more. Yeah, I'll pray. Can we pray? Let's all bow our heads for a moment. Father, we thank you so much for your incredible gift of grace to us. And I thank you for the patterns that you have called us to live by, the ways, the laws, the standard that which you call us to live and that it's good and that it's right and it's, Lord, it leads us to this incredible path called life. And so Father, I pray for all of us that you would help us to, to live the life you're calling us to live. Give us the strength, give us the grace, give us the courage to live this life your way. Lord, help us not to conform to the patterns of this world. That It is easier to do that, but God, you are calling us to live at a higher level and a higher standard. And so God, I pray you help us to do it. Help us to live the life you're calling us to live. Help us to build great marriages and families. Help us to love our spouses. Lord, help us to die to ourselves in that process that the two could become one. Father, I pray for those who are in dating relationships. Help us to do them with integrity and the right way, your way, pursuing you in it all. And God, I, I pray that all, in all our relationships, we'd honor you, Lord, above everything else. And I pray that for any who've messed up now, right now in Jesus' name, we just confess our sin to you, confess our need for you. And I thank you for your gift of grace. Thank you for washing clear, washing clean, every sin, every spot, every blemish from our yesterday and that you give us a hope for our tomorrow. Lord, help that grace that you give to us lead us towards a life of righteousness and holiness and a life in you. And Lord, I just wanna pray for another group of people. Just right now, with every eyes closed and head bowed, if you're here in the room today, maybe you don't know Jesus, 
Maybe you've never made a decision to follow Him or maybe you're, you're just, your life is not right with God today, but you wanna get right with God. I would love to lead you in a very simple prayer. The truth is, friends, God loves you. God made you. God has a great plan for your life. We all mess up. We all fall short of His standard and there's a payment for our sin and the payment is death. God in His grace, He sent His own Son, Jesus, to a cross. When He died on that cross, He paid the debt that you and I would do for our sin. And He conquered death and the grave and He rose again to new life and He extends to every single person here today, not judgment, not condemnation, but grace, forgiveness for all your wrongs, a brand new life that begins right here, right now. It's called being born again by the Spirit of God. God will make you a new person from the inside out. You get to walk into the plans that God has for your life. And then friends, there's this great promise of eternity in heaven with Him. If you're not right with God today, but you wanna be, I wanna invite you to pray this prayer with me. I wanna pray it out loud. You pray it with me in your heart, but when you pray it, you mean it with everything you've got. If you're online today, pray this in your home, wherever you are. If you're with us in Whangarei, pray along with me now. Just say these words in your heart. Say, God, today, I surrender my life to you. I know I've sinned, but I believe Jesus, you died for me. So right now, I turn from my old way and I turn to you. I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of all my wrongs. Come and be the Lord of my life. I choose from this day to live for you in Jesus' name. Just with your eyes still closed and every head bowed, if you prayed that prayer tonight, I wanna tell you I'm really proud of you and I wanna invite you to do something really brave for me. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna count to three. When I get to three, if you prayed that prayer, either for the very first time or you're getting your life right with God tonight, I want you to be really brave right where you are and I want you to put your hand up nice and high when I get to three. I'm not doing that to embarrass you or stand you up. All I'm gonna do is I'll see you, I'll acknowledge you, you can put your hand straight back down. I know there's people in this room that need to make this decision. Be bold, be brave. Take that little step of faith on the count of three. One, two, three. Hands up nice and high right now. Say, Steve, that's me. That's me. Awesome. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Anyone else saying, that's me. God bless you, my man. I see you. Thank you, sir. Fantastic. Anyone else saying, Steve, that's me. Right down the back. Right down the back. I got you. Awesome. Well, Father, we thank you so much for the work you're doing here. God, we thank you for those lost loved ones that have come home to you. And God, I pray you bless them. God, I pray that they would know the forgiveness of their sin and they would know the full life that comes from Jesus. Lord, I pray you bless them, fill them. May this be a day that is marked in the history books for them. Lord, that from this day forward, they were never the same. Lord, I thank you for them. We bless them right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church, we put our hands together, those people. Come on, we celebrate. That's amazing. Can we thank our panelists uh, for today? Incredible.